Bien, l'audience est reprise. The court is back in session. You may proceed, Ms. Biasse. Thank you, Your Honor. Before uh, starting, I wanted to tell the trial chamber that I provided to the chamber and to the accused a sheet that associates the names of uh, three witnesses uh, with a letter of the alphabet. And this is just to ensure that the identities of witnesses are not disclosed when I address non-public information. I may not use all the names, but I understand that the trial chamber would prefer not to go in and out of a private session, so this is my attempt to try to prevent doing that. Hopefully, I, I can make it work. Your Honors, the accused committed crimes in Croatia. He committed crimes in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And he also committed crimes in Serbia. In this case, he gave a speech in the village of Herkovsi on May 6, 1992. That speech ignited the flames of ethnic hatred and forever changed the face of that village. He accomplished exactly what he set out to do, to force Croats out of the village and out of Serbia. Before Yugoslavia started breaking apart, the village in Herkovsi, in Vojvodina, Serbia, was ethnically diverse. It had a Croat majority, as well as Hungarians and Serbs. Witnesses described that there were many mixed marriages between Serbs and Croats or Hungarians. And the people of different ethnicities, they lived together in peace and in harmony. That tranquility began to change, slowly at first, as the village was infected by the violent inter-ethnic conflict in neighboring Croatia and then in BIH, as more and more refugees from Serb refugees came into Vojvodina looking for safety and places to live. After the accused delivered his hate speech on 6 May 1992, the changes that had begun slowly in Herkovsi exploded into ethnic tension and fear. The accused personally brought that tension and fear to the people of Herkovsi with his hatred. He personally made Croats so afraid that many fled the village soon after. He personally encouraged Serb refugees in Herkovsi to participate in his persecution campaign against Croats. As highlighted in paragraphs 561 and 562 of the prosecution's closing brief, the evidence shows beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused physically committed persecution through the hate speech because of what he said who he was, and the context of war in which he made the speech. He targeted Herkovsi as the place for the May 6 SRS rally because Herkovsi was majority Croat and was considered, quote, Ustasha, end quote, territory during World War II. And not only did he target Herkovsi as a place for this rally, he targeted the date. He targeted May 6th as the day for the SRS rally in Herkovsi because it was St. George's Day, a very important Serb holiday. So he chose to spend a significant Serb holiday in a Croat majority village an event that was advertised with posters and announced on Radio Ruma, transcript page 10337. On the day of the accused hate speech, he and the SRS 
set the stage for maximum impact. They purposely filled her kafsi with an intimidating atmosphere. Ethnically divisive and intimidating Chetnik music played from a loudspeaker. A large group of armed men wearing black World War II era Chetnik uniforms arrived and spread throughout the town. A much larger crowd of Serb refugees was present at the rally site. They had all come to see and hear the accused. And there are also some local Croats there as well. This is described at transcript page 10, 335, and ex in exhibits P329 and 1329. The security provided for the rally far surpassed that of any electoral campaign. In addition to the armed Chetnik men, there was a policeman with an automatic rifle in the street at every 100 meters. The level of security provided for the rally was so intense, it reminded Witness A.H. of the times when Tito passed through. A member of the accused security detail carried what appeared to be a bayonet and stood by the stage. It was clear, clear that the objective was to, quote, create fear, a different psychological atmosphere among the local population, end quote. Transcript pages 10, 335, 10337 to 10338 and 10489. A list of prominent Croats in her Kalfsi was read to the crowd. The accused admits in Exhibit P31, pages 1304 to 1305, that a member of the SRS party standing next to him read out the list and those Croats were labeled as disloyal. During his speech, the accused repeated his rhetoric of hatred and division and pounded his chest. He called for greater Serbia. He denigrated Croats of Herkovsi as Ustasha. He labeled them disloyal enemies of the Serbian people. He accused some Croats as being in the, quote, Ustasha National Guard, end quote, branded their parents as disloyal and as having no place in Herkovsi. He called for Croats to be forced out of Herkovsi. He shouted, quote, let them go to their homeland, end quote. <coughs> he accused Tuchman of driving Serbs from Croatia. And he promised Serb refugees they could move into the Croat houses in Herkovsi. He encouraged every Serb family of refugees to knock on a Croat door and give its inhabitants an address in a Croatian place outside of Serbia. He delivered an ultimatum to Herkovsi's Croats, move to Croatia or be placed on buses and be sent to the border, saying, quote, there will be enough buses. We will drive them to the border of Serb territory and they can walk on from there, end quote. And that's in Exhibit P 547 at page four. He instructed, quote, Serbs from Herkovsi and other villages, end quote, to, quote, promptly get rid of the remaining Croats, end quote. He promised Serbs that they would overcome economic and social crises by getting rid of the remaining Croats. And he threatened Croats that, quote, they would have nowhere to return to, end quote. 
very similar language that he used with respect to the cleansed town of Osayek that I described to the trial chamber previously. And what did the crowd do? The crowd applauded and shouted, quote, Ustasha out. This is Serbia, end quote. As addressed in the prosecution closing brief at paragraphs 559 and 562, the accused Masic speech constitutes persecution. In his speech, the accused invoked a litany of the same hateful denigration that he used to justify the commission of crimes to achieve the common criminal purpose in Croatia and in BIH. In a book published after he was indicted in this case, the accused produced a partial transcript of that May 6th speech. Even though it is a partial transcript, it fully establishes the accused's intent to persecute Croats through his hate speech, especially given the context in which the speech was given, namely the raging inter-ethnic conflict in Croatia and in BIH. When the accused finished his May 6th hate speech, he had personally committed the crime of persecution. And despite what he claims, his speech in Herkovsi was not an innocent election promise. As set out in the Nahimana Appeals Judgment, especially in paragraph 771, there is no legal protection for hate speech based on conditional language. This accused delivered a speech filled with ethnic hatred and fear-mongering. He exploited his status and authority to deliberately fuel the tension between local Croats and Serb refugees. He exploited the ongoing violence in Croatia that made both Croats and Serbs frightened. By so doing, he breached the cloak that protects free speech and transformed his hate speech into a crime in and of itself. And for that, he is criminally responsible. His speech violated the Croats' right to dignity and security. The Croats in Herkovsi who heard his words or heard about them knew that he was not making empty threats. They knew the accused was an influential elected official who publicly flaunted his quasi-military authority inside and outside of Serbia. They knew about the crimes committed by Sheshlyevsi. They knew the accused influenced and controlled Sheshlyevsi, and he was synonymous with his Sheshlyevsi, and they were notorious for their participation in crimes committed in Croatia. And I'd refer to uh, transcript page 15415, as well as 15411 and 15412. Immediately after his speech, many Croats began preparing to leave Herkovsi, showing they felt denigrated and threatened, just as the accused intended. By August 1992, the Serb leadership of the village changed the name of Herkovsi to Serbislavsi to reflect that Serbs were now the majority. That's only three months after the accused May 6th speech. Even the signposts into and out of the village were changed to Serbislavsi. Transcript pages. 10382 to 10383, as well as exhibit P549. But the accused had begun targeting non Serbs in Vojvodina and Herkovsi as early as September 1991 during the war in Croatia. 
And I'm now citing the evidence of witness A uh, on your sheet. As described in exhibits P1112, pages 5 to 6, P1129, pages 26 to 28, 161 to 163, the accused gave instructions in September of 1991 for how this persecution campaign should be carried out in Herkovsi. Dismissing non-Serbs from government jobs. Threatening non-Serbs through intimidating telephone calls. Attacking non-Serbs. Attacking their homes. Marking non-Serb houses. Throwing grenades. And breaking windows. So, at the same time he was giving instructions for the persecution campaign against Herkovsi's Croats in 1991, the accused was also denigrating Croats in Croatia. Serb forces, including Shashlyevsi, implemented a brutal campaign of persecution against Croats in targeted areas of Croatia. And his persecutorial speeches and the campaign itself were reported throughout Serbia. And it's important to consider what the Croats in Serbia were seeing. Throughout Croatia, JNA tanks rolled, Croat towns shelled, Croats expelled, Croats killed. Croatia was being cleansed of Croats. And the accused wanted to cleanse Serbia of its Croats. <clears throat> but this did not happen in 1991 or in the beginning of 1992. The accused Before the May 6th hate speech, it's true that two or three Croat families did leave. And I'd refer the trial chamber to transcript page 15461 and 15498. But most of them remained until May 6th, 1992. And too many Croats remained for the accused. So his May 6th speech was designed to reach new dimensions of persecution by targeting Croats and sowing fear in the village. The events following the accused persecution through his 6th May speech proves that he committed forcible transfer and deportation and that he aided and abetted and instigated others to persecute and forcibly transfer and deport Croats from Herkovsi. Reports of his hate speech and the reaction of the crowd spread through the Croatian community of Herkovsi. Fear and panic infected that community and news spread as one would imagine in a small village. It spread by word of mouth, from person to person, from household to household. And Croats decided they had no real choice but to leave Herkovsi. The accused had warned them to, quote, clear out of Serbia, end quote. And they did. They were so frightened after the speech, they started collecting travel documents, and many left. The accused had directed Serbs to, quote, promptly get rid of the remaining Croats in your and surrounding villages, end quote. They did, and they cleaned up the Croats who remained in Herkovsi. The accused intended to and succeeded in instilling fear in the local Croat population 
against whom he advocated discrimination and violence. His speech aggravated an already tense situation between local Croats and Serb refugees in Herkovsi. He created an atmosphere so coercive that most Croats could not remain there any longer. Local Croats took the accused threats very seriously. And they took his threats very seriously because his hate speech was interpreted as that, a threat, a warning sign that simply, quote, could not be ignored. After the speech, Croats began collecting travel documents. Quote, they were standing in queues and waiting like in embassies, end quote. Now direct the trial chamber to transcript page 9920. and direct the trial chamber to the evidence of witnesses Paulich and VS 6167, as well, excuse me, as VS to VS 61 and VS 67, as well as exhibits 555 and exhibit P556. And the trial chamber heard evidence that Croats began collecting records like christening certificates and marriage records from the local Catholic Church so that they could leave her copsy. The request for christening certificates and marriage records increased dramatically after the accused hate speech. Witnesses testified that they left her copsy as a direct result of that speech. And so the accused lacks any credibility when he argues, essentially, that Croats exercised a genuine choice to leave Herkovsi if they arrange house exchanges. Witness A.H. testified that nearly all those listed in the victim annex to the indictment, which he saw as exhibit P558, he said, quote, nearly all of them, quote, went to Croatia or even beyond, end quote, transcript page 10407. He could only find two examples of people who left to Croatia of their own free will because, according to him, quote, Everything else was done either out of fear or under different types of threat. End quote. Transcript page 10408. Croats did not choose to leave a community where they had been secure all their lives to go to the middle of a war in Croatia. They did not choose to uproot their lives, families, children, to leave their jobs and their friends, to go to a country being ravaged by a war they had been watching on television. They felt they had to leave because they thought their lives were in danger in Herkovsi. For those Croats who remained, they remained because they were ready to die for staying there and I direct the trial chamber's attention to Exhibit 555 on page 2. The demographic change underlying the renaming of Herkovsi as Serbislavsi is confirmed by the evidence of Witness Tabo and the October 1992 report of the UN Special Rapporteur, this is Exhibit 982, 
In paragraph 22 of Exhibit P982, references the ethnic cleansing of Croats from Vojvodina. The demographic change is further corroborated by witness evidence and press articles memorializing the flight of Croats from Herkovsi. And I've already listed one, Exhibit P555 and uh, P556, just to list a few. Exhibit P555 is an article from Nin Weekly, and it's dated the 22nd of May, 1992. So two weeks after the accused hate speech. And it's titled, quote, Hertkovsi, a village that is moving. Dr. Voislav Sheshel's program to move out the non-Serb population from Serbia is becoming a reality, end quote. A retired local policeman explained in that article that, quote, it all began after Mr. Sheshel's speech here in the village. Many people have already left the village, end quote. So all this evidence proves the impact of the accused speech beyond a reasonable doubt. So when the accused claims that only eight people were forcibly displaced from her coffee, it is an offensive and gross distortion of the facts. In his erroneous reading of the law, he argues that only those Croats who are physically harmed can qualify as being persecuted or, physic or forcibly displaced. And this is inconsistent with the law and the facts and should be rejected. The relevant paragraphs in the prosecution closing brief can be found at 522, 529, 541, 550, and 555 to 564. I would like now to address the evidence that shows that the accused aided, abetted, and instigated persecution and forcible transfer and deportation with his speech. His speech in her copsy must be assessed in the context of all of his other language denigrating Croats. As one example, on April 1st, 1992, exactly as the Serb takeovers were being implemented in BIH, the accused used the National Assembly to attack Croats in Serbia. He said Croats should be forced from Serbia in retaliation for Tuchman forcing Serbs out of Croatia. He rejected the notion that there were any loyal Croats in Serbia, and this is reflected in Exhibit P16, which I will ask to be played now. Holding that the argument was not going in the right direction, Sheshe asked to speak again. If the Croats are expelling the Serbs from Zagreb, what were the Croats waiting for in Belgrade and in Serbia? According to him, this represents a normal exchange of people on the principles of retortion, or as he explained it, the retaliation. Mahmoud Memic and Anton Skiderovic acted in response to this. Anton Skiderovic said that Shesha's viewpoints had already been known, but that it was good that at that time he presented them from the assembly floor and thus marked the Croats in Serbia as hostages. Further, in his response, Shesha maintained that this regime was too lenient towards Croats and that after after the next elections, all of them would be expelled and that not even those living in Serbia would sleep peacefully until they moved. By the same right, Tujman used the, to expel Serbs, we will expel Croats, said Sheshe, adding that he wanted to disperse another illusion about the loyal behavior of Croats in Serbia since he maintained they were aiding the Ustashes in this war too. So, according to the accused, Croats were, quote, aiding the Ustashas in this war, too, end quote. And the accused maintained the pressure on Croats in Herkovsi by making a special, personal appearance in that small village, 
mustering all the pomp and circumstance and political quasi-military trappings that had become no the norm for his appearances. What resulted was a campaign of discrimination, coercion, and violence directed against Croats, and some of the perpetrators are linked to the accused. Directly following the accused Masik speech, Croats were harassed, intimidated, and threatened in exactly the same way the accused had instructed in September of 1991. Quote, threats were coming in every day, end quote. Hand grenades were thrown at Croat houses. Dogs were killed. Bomb threats were made. Transcript pages 10777, transcript page 9919, and exhibits P551, P559, and P64, to name a few. The evidence shows that through his support and encouragement, the accused tools like Ostoya Shibinchic, Rade Chakmak, and others targeted Croats just as the accused intended with his May 6 speech. I refer the trial chamber to exhibit P564, page 5, transcript pages 2471, 2475 to 2476, as well as exhibits P1129, pages 26 to 28, and P1112, pages 5 to 6. Sibincic was one of the organizers of the May 6 SRS rally. He stood on the side of the stage during the speeches that day, and along with others, both he and Chakmak terrorized Croats in Herkovsi. Both were the accused men in Herkovsi. In spring, they traveled to the SRS office in Belgrade, where the accused gave him, quote, the green light, end quote, to drive Croats from Herkovsi. The accused had also given the green light to target to others to target Croats in Herkovsi in May 1992. This evidence is reflected in exhibits P1058, paragraphs 102 and 101, exhibit P1056, paragraphs 87 to 88, exhibit P1112, page 12, P1129, pages 27 to 28, and 65 to 66. Many inside and outside of Herkovsi claimed that Sabinchich worked closely with the accused, that he was the accused's right-hand man, and that he did all the dirty work of the SRS in Herkovsi. I refer the chamber to the testimony of witnesses Baricevic, AH, VS 67, VS 1036, VS 61, and P 564, page 5. Since 1992, Sibincic and Chakmak were charged, together with three others, for committing crimes against Croats in Herkovsi. But far from condemning their actions or even remaining silent, the accused, on the 27th of August, 1992, publicly demanded their release. Quote, Sabincic and the others arrested in Serbislavsi, former Herkovsi, should be immediately released. Exhibit P1202, page 10. And the accused is referring to Herkovsi as former Herkovsi 
mere months after his May 6th speech. With this public demand, the accused showed both his affiliation with Sabinchic and he further encouraged and aided and abetted the criminal campaign of persecution and forcible displacement that had occurred in her copsy. Before concluding, I will address some additional claims raised by the accused in his trial brief. First, the trial chamber has admitted the statement of witness A on your sheet as P1112. His viva voce testimony was admitted as P1129. Witness A was cross-examined in that other case. His admitted evidence is credible and reliable. But the accused claims in his brief that witness A is a defense witness who recanted his OTP statements during another proceeding. One, I refer the trial chamber to the argumentative appendix to the prosecution closing brief. Two, witnesses A's, witness A's unsworn, unadmitted statements are not evidence in this case. His sworn, unadmitted testimony in another proceeding is not evidence in this case. What is in the trial record in this case as reliable and probative evidence are his admitted statement and admitted testimony. The second issue I'll address raised by the accused. According to him, he can only be convicted of instigating his followers or sympathizers if there had been a local SRS board in Herkovsi at the time of the speech because that is the only manner in which he could have exerted any influence. This claim is baseless. There is no legal or factual basis for it, and it should be rejected summarily. Even if it were true that the accused did not have a formal local board, he certainly had sympathizers and supporters. The very reason he could and did have a rally in Herkovsi in the first place. And third, as set out in the appeals chamber decision on the 31st of August 2004 in this case, regarding the jurisdictional requirement, <coughs> Article 5 does not require a material nexus between the acts of the accused and the armed conflict only a connection between the Article 5 crime and the armed conflict. It is sufficient that the acts coincide geographically and temporally with the armed conflict. At all times relevant to the indictment, a state of armed conflict existed in Croatia and the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the crimes committed by the accused in Herkovsi are linked to the conflict in Croatia and to his pursuit of greater Serbia. When the accused committed the crimes in Herkovsi, a conflict was ongoing in Croatia. Both Serb and Croat civilians suffered the consequences of that conflict, and Serbs from Croatia fled to Serbia. The Serb refugees who arrived in Herkovsi saw Croats in Serbia as a cause of their suffering and tensions Rose. And the accused himself makes the link between what was happening in Croatia and Serbia. And he charged Vojvodina Croats with conspiring with Tuchman as Ustasha's. For example, on the trial chamber has other examples, but one example is from the 12th of June, 1992 when the accused declared in a radio interview that Croats, quote, will have to move out according to the principles of reciprocity. I mean, since Tujman expelled more than 300 Serbs, what are the Croats in Serbia waiting for? End quote. Three hundred thousand Serbs, that should be. 
expelled more than 300 Serbs, 300,000 Serbs. Furthermore, as the trial chamber has already heard, President Milosevic, President of the Republic of Serbia, provided military, police, and political support from Serbia to the conflict in Croatia and BIH. The accused himself, he also gathered volunteers in Serbia and deployed them to Croatia and BIH. Consequently, the jurisdictional requirement under Article 5 is satisfied regarding her copsy in Serbia. And this is highlighted in the prosecution closing brief at paragraphs 542 to 544 and 548 to 550. The accused has not disputed the drastic demographic changes in her COFSI. What he offers are excuses and justifications seeking to disconnect himself from the mass exodus of Croats that his speech caused. None of these claimed justifications, justifications undermine the, pre, the, the evidence presented by the prosecution. In conclusion, the very fact that we can today speak of Herkovsi before May 6, 1992, and after the accused words on that day, highlights how his crimes permanently changed the face of a peaceful multi-ethnic village in Serbia. I will conclude my remarks there, Your Honors, and then I will turn the lectern over to Mr. Markison. Merci, Madame Berset. Je vais donc céder la parole à Monsieur Markusen. Bien, Monsieur Markusen, vous avez la parole. You may proceed. Your Honours, the accused's individual criminal responsibility for the crimes charged in the indictment has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. For the accused, Greater, Sar greater Serbia is his raison d'être. Throughout the trial, the accused has tried to cast himself as the victim of conspiracies and injustice because of an ideological belief in Greater Serbia. He makes these claims to distract attention from what the evidence in this case has proven, namely that he is responsible for the suffering of tens of thousands of victims who were expelled from their homes, murdered, detained, tortured, raped, and whose villages, towns, and religious sites were wantonly destroyed as a result of his words and his acts. The disintegration of the former Yugoslavia tore its constituent republics apart. So, the accused and other JCE members put aside their political differences. And the accused in close cooperation with other JCE members, set out to create a Serb-only state. When the Serb autonomous regions were created in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, the accused began a relentless propaganda campaign to justify the creation of Greater Serbia. The accused's political position allowed him to deliver his propaganda to a wide audience. The same position cloaked his word with respectability. His propaganda was ethnically denigrating and dehumanizing. He was a proponent of the idea that non-Serbs who once were neighbors, friends, and family 
were now subhuman, genocidal, and needed to be expelled from the new greater Serbia by all available means, as he said on the 5th of March, 20 years ago. When he said non-Serbs should fear the Serbs, crimes targeting non-Serbs were soon committed. With his words, he planted the seeds of ethnic hatred and helped them grow into ethnic violence against non-Serbs. The accused crafted his public persona as the commander of an armed force that could carry out his will. Using the SGP and the SIS war staff which he controlled, the accused recruited and organized thousands of volunteers. These volunteers were so closely associated with him that they were known as his men, Shashiljevsi. He sent them into Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina to support the newly created Serb structures such as TOs in Croatia and the SDS crisis staffs in Bosnia and Herzegovina. When the JNA, as a result of desertion and the purge of non-Serbs, was in need for his Shashiljevsi, he sent his units to participate in its operations in Croatia. His Shashiljevsi fought together with other Serb forces that the JNA members, that the JCE members had established and controlled. Through his contacts with other JCE members and through his war staff, the accused ensured that his Shashiljevsi were armed, equipped, transported and deployed. He ensured that they had jobs to go back to and received benefits so they could be deployed. He provided encouragement and moral support with his visits to the front and in his speeches praising their successes. At least from August 1991, the joint Serb fighting force that the accused and other JCE members had created was engaged in a campaign of persecution against the non-Serb population in vast areas in vast areas of Croatia where the accused Shashiljevsi became notorious for their brutality and crimes. Despite the horrible consequences of the campaign in Croatia, the accused continued his relentless propaganda campaign against Croats. He instigated the commission of further crimes by incessantly equating Croats to Eustatia fascists, and he repeated his calls for blind revenge for Eustatia crimes against Serbs during the Second World War. As he intended, crimes were committed. The JNA wantonly destroyed Vukovar and forced most of its non-Serb population to flee. As they had done in area after area that had fallen before, when Vukovar fell, Serb forces including numerous Shashiljevsi that the accused had personally decided to send to Vukovar, expelled, raped, beat, tortured, raped, and abused the remaining non-Serb population. The accused and the other JCE members continued their persecutorial campaign in Bosnia and Herzegovina when it moved for independence. The accused fully supported the continued persecutorial campaign there. He intensified this propaganda campaign against Muslims and Croats. 
He sent thousands of his Shashaljevsi to support the newly established crisis staffs and TOs in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The accused's threat of rivers of blood became gruesome reality for the non-Serbs when his Shashaljevsi in Bosnia and Herzegovina participated in the atrocities committed by Serb forces as they took control over Serb claimed areas. In Svornik, Greater Sarajevo, Mostar and Nevisenje, his Shashaljevsi participated in the systematic expulsion, detention, murder, torture, rape and other sexual abuse of non-Serbs and the wanton destruction of their property and religious sites. Your Honours, the evidence in this case has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the accused is responsible for the commission of the crimes that he did not personally carry out, but which were committed by his Shashilevsi and members of the Serb forces controlled by the, Shashi, by the JCE members set out in the indictment. Because, one, the accused and the other JCE members, at least by August 1991, were joined in a crum, common criminal purpose to conduct a widespread and systematic campaign of persecution against the non-Serb in the areas targeted as Serb land in Croatia and Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Two, the crimes were an integral part of this common purpose. And three, the accused significantly contributed to the common criminal purpose by his relentless propaganda and instigation and by the thousands of Shashilevsi that he sent to commit and participate in the crimes. The evidence has also proven that the accused <coughs> committed persecution through hate speech in Vukovar and Hrtkovci. The speeches in these places threatened Croats and were given in the context of high ethnic tension. Those speeches, beyond a reasonable doubt, deprived the Croats in those areas of their right to safety and deprived them of their right to dignity. Moreover, as a result of the coercive environment that the accused created, with his speech in Hrtkovci, as we have just heard, many Croats felt forced to leave the village. And he is therefore also responsible for deportation and forcible transfer. He is therefore guilty for the crimes set out in the indictment. And as set out in the prosecution's closing brief, he is also responsible for instigating and aiding and abetting the crimes set out in the indictment. And now, proven guilty of these crimes, he must be punished. The accused's crimes in Vukovar, Svornik, Greater Sarajevo, Mostar, Nevisinje and Hrtkovci are grave both in scale and by their heinous nature. His criminal acts and conduct dramatically changed the character of the targeted municipalities from multi-ethnic communities to Serb-only areas by forcibly transfer transferring and deporting tens of thousands of non-Serbs primarily Croats and Muslims, resulted in the devastation of towns and villages, 
including Croat and Muslim homes, hospitals, stores, and cemeteries. Led to the plunder and encouraged the destruction of religious sites and caused the murder of 905 people. Not only were the accused's crimes massive in scale, they were also particularly brutal. His acts and conduct contributed to the murder of children, newborn, pregnant women, the elderly, and the sick. Crosses carved on the skin of Muslims. The rape of both women and men under the most sadistic of circumstances. His crimes deserve a punishment that reflect the gravity. And there are no mitigating circumstances. The accused's voluntary surrender should not be considered a mitigating circumstance because it was his legal obligation to surrender. Moreover, in detention and in court, his conduct have not warranted mitigation. On the contrary, the accused announced that he was here to shatter the tribunal and he has used the trial as a political platform for his continued agenda of Serb ethnic supremacy. He has made every effort to obstruct the proper functioning of the tribunal in its search for truth and accountability. The accused has been contemptuous throughout this trial. He persistently verbally verbally abused witnesses in court despite repeated instructions from the court to cease. He and his associates discouraged witnesses who were connected to the accused during the conflict from appearing and testifying truthfully. In some cases, even instructing them on how to disavow their prior statements. And the accused has repeatedly breached orders for the protection of witnesses. These are significant aggravating circumstances. In addition, the accused shows no remorse. Of his propaganda and instigation, he has said before this chamber, I quote, and you think that what you were reading yesterday, the quotes from my speeches, and when you showed the clips of my speeches, that I was bothered. You did me a service. You have reminded the Serbian people of what I did over those years and how I gained my reputation amongst the Serbian people. End of quote. He has also told the tribunal repeatedly, I am proud of everything I said then, and I am re prepared to repeat all of my speeches even today. And these two quotes are from transcript pages 16,801 and 16,818. And in fact, at the hearing on Monday, he said about his words, these, quote, are the words of a genius that I am still proud of, even today. 
that is a transcript page 48, line 4. And I can provide the chamber a bit later, if needed, with the transcript reference to the official transcript. No trial, conviction, and sentence will bring back the lives lost and ruined by the accused's crimes. But this fact just does not justify failing to impose a substantial sentence of imprisonment. The prosecution recommends a sentence of 28 years to run consecutive to any, se any other sentence imposed on him for his contempt of this tribunal. That concludes the prosecution's closing arguments for now. The prosecution reserves its remaining time for arguments in rebuttal should it become necessary after the accused's closing argument. I have two matters to just address to the chamber. One is that I respectfully request that the pseudonym sheet that Ms. Beersay referred to in her submissions be added to the record as an exhibit marked for identification so that it is available uh, for later review of the record. And the second thing is that at transcript page 17,145, line 13, the name Kreisnik should have been Karadic. Thank you, Jonas. Yeah. I have something to say. Moment, please. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Prosecutor. First of all, Registrar, regarding this document that has been given to us, we'd like to have an exhibit number for it for us to be able to use it later on. Yes, sir, that will be exhibit number P1404. Under seal. Yeah. Thank you. The accused closing arguments are scheduled to take place as of Monday at 2.15. He will have 10 hours, all included, for his closing arguments. Furthermore, the trial chamber invites the accused, should he have any documents that he wants to use, including the two books that he uh, submitted uh, to the trial chamber, one with a uh, red cover, another with a blue cover. I'm not giving the titles. In order to make the interpreter's work easier, just in case he might refer to pages in these two books, I invite him, therefore, to provide them prior to the Monday hearing through the registrar so that the interpreters may prepare those pages he might want to use. Uh, these two books, the one with the blue cover, the other with the red cover, are a new uh, are reprints, uh, therefore there may be some changes between the latest book that we had and the one that uh, we don't, so there may be uh, inconsistencies or changes. So if he so wishes, of course, he's not forced to, but uh, if he can, he could provide these documents. This is not evidence, of course. Uh, these books are merely... documents that he might want to refer to if uh, he should feel the need to do so. Equally, when he makes his closing arguments, I should invite uh, the prosecution to remain silent unless there should be a mistake in the transcript or should the name of a protected witness uh, be named? 
but of course the trial chamber is free uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. Mm, I repeat, closing arguments must be listened to in absolute silence. The same goes for the accused's closing arguments. Before I give the floor to Mr. Shechel, yes, Mr. Markison, do you have anything to say? Your Honours, as, as the Chamber just indicated, uh, the books in question are not in evidence, um, so the prosecution would find that it is improper for the accused to be referring to this. There might be certain excerpts of the books that are in evidence uh, as separate prosecution exhibits, and if the accused make reference to, make use of those, of course, he's using the record, and that is not a problem. But in our submission, he cannot be making reference to material which is not in evidence. He must confine himself to the trial record. That interpretation is inaccurate. First of all, you stopped me from leading my defense case. All the documents that I tendered during cross-examination at the beginning of the trial, you refused. And after that, I stopped tendering anything, since you have not given me the possibility to lead my defense case. I put forward to you in good time two of my books. One is the Roman Catholic project of the creation of the artificial Croatian nation, and the other one is the ideology of Serbian nationalism. I intend to use certain quotes from those books as an integral part of my closing arguments, not as leading evidence, because whatever I tendered, you refused. You did not allow me to make my defense case. For me, that is over. But instead of recalling things off the top of my head, I in intend to read passages from those books. I will not provide those quotes in advance. The translation service can make copies of these books, and when I say page so-and-so, they can find the page. I don't have the ability to provide this. I have no one to help me, and the administration of the prison does not allow me to make any submissions because they don't want to make photocopies for me. And photocopies are the only proof I have of submitting something. But the reason I wanted the floor is to say this. Mr. Markison does not have the right to reserve time. He was granted 10 hours for the prosecution's closing arguments. He didn't know how to use all of the 10 hours. That's his problem. I will use all of my 10 hours. And I may ask for another two or three hours in addition. That's my right. In all the other cases where the accused is self-represented, he is given advantages in terms of time. For instance, Mr. Milosevic had 60% as opposed to 40% of the prosecution. In other cases, the accused's time is not limited. You have limited me to the time used by the prosecution. I will probably, although I don't know yet, I can't estimate properly now, I may well ask for additional time. The prosecution has the right to a rebuttal. You will decide how much time. But it's not the time that he has spared. Whatever time you give the prosecutor for rebuttal, you will have to give me the same amount of time to respond to the rebuttal. That's my right. I will not reserve any time from my closing argument, and I'm just reminding you that you have to do this. And if you don't do it, 
even better for me. That's another argument how this tribunal is humiliating itself. And I prefer to see you losing face. Decision the trial chamber set uh, the amount of hours for each party and made sure to say that closing arguments for either party uh, are but an addition uh, to uh, the briefs that were filed. The prosecution filed their briefs, so did you. Uh, yours are over 600 pages long. Uh, we were infinitely generous towards you and we granted you 10 hours, which is an inordinate time, amount of time. I have no memory in this tribunal of closing arguments uh, lasting as many as 10 hours. Usually, uh, much less time is given for the purpose. However, uh, this uh, tribunal uh, says that in ex exceptional circumstances following closing arguments, the practice is that the prosecutor may have the floor for specific points, in which case uh, the defense is also entitled, obviously, uh, to close uh, the proceedings in speaking last. This is the rule in law on this matter. Closing arguments are closing arguments. You've heard the prosecution's closing arguments. You're now totally free to speak to whatever topic you decide. But please do not waste the trial chamber's time. We therefore will make sure that your time is used in the best way possible for your defense. But um, I'm not worried. Uh, I'm sure that you're going to make best use of your time. You told us uh, that uh, despite my invitation uh, to give uh, the books to the interpreters, you've decided not to do so. Well, interpreters are wonderful anyway, do make wonders. Uh, and. Uh, I've read the two books, so of course I'll, I'll make sure that I can check uh, what you say because I have read over 2,000 pages in preparation for this. And you yourself admitted that this is not in evidence or evidence, but that you will refer to these books. So I see no problem whatsoever. Yes, Mr. Sheshel, one last word. Gospodine. Mr. President, I no longer have the books in English. My legal advisors recently brought me five sets of those books, and immediately, as soon as they entered the uh, prison building, I handed them over to the guards to forward to the tribunal. Three sets for the trial chamber, one set for the prosecutor, and one set for the registrar. I don't see that I could have done anything more. They could not have brought more than that. And it turns out that their visit, since I was not given the right to privileged communication, we spent two days sitting down talking about anything. We couldn't talk about my case because uh, the conversation was uh, eavesdropped. My case manager, Nemanja Sharovic, was present, but we could not have access to privileged communication. Since we did not have an interpreter to control our conversation, we concluded that the conversation was eavesdropped uh, uh, and they had the right to do that because at the, at the outset they told us that our communication was not privileged. They brought five sets of books. If they had sent them by mail or if my wife had brought them to the prison, the prison officers would have provided me with just one set and the rest would have been confiscated. Nobody would have ever asked me why I needed five sets because the prison authorities are afraid of my propaganda being spread amongst other detainees. One more thing I need to tell you. I learned yesterday from a document that I had been provided 
uh, by uh, the registry was that uh, there was a ban on my contacting and uh, all the other prisoners, and that was never provided in writing to me. Ne uh, we're talking about Goran Hajic and some others. Why do I know that that applies to Goran Hajic? Because... Hajic was in uh, the living room with his family and I was locked up with my legal advisors. Uh, this is just unheard of. If there is any reason for the, uh, that communication to be banned, then I should be provided with an order and an explanation. Why Hajic of all people? Because in my uh, proceedings, I uh, unmasked everything that was happening around Ovchara, and the prosecution is still insisting on the old um, uh, story about the military security service, the civilian security service, everybody uh, handed en ce qui concerne les trois juges qui sont devant vous, quoi que vous pouviez penser d'eux, nous n'avons rien interdit du tout. Donc, s'il y a une contestation... Problème ouais. Je reprends. Mr. Seychelles. Mr. Seychelles, I was saying that the trial chamber hasn't uh, banned anything whatsoever, and the issue you are raising comes under the competence of the president and the registry, not us. So what you have just said is on the transcript, but as far as we are concerned, I can confirm that we haven't banned anything whatsoever. That said, since everything has been said, we shall meet again at a quarter past two on Monday. All rise. Feu vous levez.